Good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Kircher. A bit of a change tonight. Casey Nolan is helping with the coverage of the death of Missouri State Auditor and Republican candidate for governor, Tom Schweik. That story, the personal aspects and the political ramifications is still developing. So while Casey is working on that, we're going to be exploring a topic tonight that we've been thinking about for quite some time. This is part of our American Graduate Initiative. And while it might seem odd on a cold, wintry night to be talking about our plans for the summer, not really, not if you've got kids. We'll be talking about what kids might be doing, could be doing, should be doing during the summer break and the impact that has on their progress in school. Who's moving ahead during the summer? Perhaps more important, who's falling behind? Stay tuned. And on Stay Tuned, you drive the discussion. We bring local experts, journalists, and civic leaders together to have tough conversations for a stronger St. Louis. Tweet us your insights on tonight's topic, and you've got a seat at the table. With a few national experts and a panel of community members, this is the show bringing more light and less heat to the issues that matter. So stay tuned. When you have the summer off from formal schooling, as we do in America for the most part, it's not always easy to go back in late August for the new school year and just pick up where you left off. I remember that to be particularly true with math, and the research kind of backs that up. But back then, I think nobody was worrying so much about it. As it turns out, the research is showing that learning loss during the summer is a very real thing, especially for kids who don't have resources, advantages, and environment that a lot of middle and upper income kids do. And that means that kids are losing ground to other kids, summer after summer after summer. Let's look at two children, one from a middle income family, the other from one of the millions of low income American families. As the two kids head off to kindergarten, look what happens. The middle income child starts out with a six month lead. The low-income child is already falling behind because of a lack of access to early reading and preschool education. During their year in kindergarten, in the same school and classroom, the two children will learn at about the same rate, so we'll move them both forward nine months. But look what happens in that first summer between kindergarten and first grade. Our middle-income child moves ahead about a month in reading because learning of one kind or another continues over the summer. The low-income child falls back about two months. So when school begins again, when they go back for first grade, the gap between them has already widened. During first grade, again, they move ahead at about the same rate, another nine months. That next summer, the activities and lifestyle of the middle-income family keep that child moving forward, but the low-income child has fewer opportunities to reinforce good habits like reading, and that child falls farther behind. Then we come to second grade, and again, our two children learn at the same rate. But the summer after second grade sets our low-income child back again, and our middle-income child moves forward again, and the gap widens again. By just the third grade, the two children are already far apart. By the end of fifth grade, the gap between the children is two and a half to three years. It will keep growing through middle school. So you see, without addressing what's happening during the summer, it is impossible to ever catch up. It's impossible to close the gap. No matter how much high quality learning goes on from September to June, every year the gap widens. So if we're not talking about keeping kids in school all summer long, and we actually will talk about that a little bit, what kind of programs are out there that can help either minimize the learning loss or move kids ahead or just keep them interested and active? We will be talking about that tonight, but before that, here's what some of the experts are telling us about why we should care. 
So we know from more than 100 years worth of research that all kids, regardless of their income level, lose skills in math over the summer without practice. So on average, kids are losing two to three months worth of those hard-earned school year skills over the summer without practice. What we know in literacy is a little bit different. So whereas middle and higher income kids really retain and even grow their literacy skills over the summer months, uh, we see low income kids lose two to three months worth of their hard earned school year skills and literacy over the summer as well. And you can imagine a few reasons why this might be the case. Um, it, it takes a little more effort to practice math skills. So where they're not as common in our day-to-day -day lives, um, you really have to work intentionally at math skills. But literacy, um, especially in middle and higher income homes, is everywhere. You have books, you have reading materials, you have educational trips. Um, but in low income homes, we might not have as many books. We might not have as many readers. Um, and so you can imagine kind of where that difference comes into play. There's some studies that have followed kids, have compared lower and middle income kids over the summer and found that two thirds of the achievement gap in reading could be attributed to what happens during the summer. So summer learning loss is a huge drag on everything that we're trying to do in education um, and, and is a really, really important focus to thinking about closing both the achievement and the opportunity gaps. Um, so some of the critical benchmarks that we look at in summer learning are third grade reading proficiency. So by the end of third grade, um, 80 percent of minority students in this country are not proficient in reading making them four times as likely to drop out of high school. We know by the time they're nine years old uh, whether or not they can read and what that means for their future. So summer learning programs are critical across the country in those pre-kindergarten through third grade years to get kids on track with reading so they can meet that critical benchmark. I've been working on this issue since 2007 and it's really um, awareness has increased greatly since then. And, and it's important, getting back to your original questions, it's, it's important because of both that achievement gap that we talked about, where you have um, you know, schools that are investing both time and resources into students for nine months of the year, and then we're seeing a lot of that effort being wasted each summer. So it's, you know, it's, a, it's from an investment standpoint, it's, it's not the best use of, of taxpayer dollars. Um, and we also know that it, it plays a large role in what we call the opportunity gap, which is this gap between um, you know, access to enriching activities that, that many middle and higher income kids take for granted um, that many lower income kids don't have access to. So the opportunity gap could be you know, over the summer months where some kids are <clears throat> going to summer camp programs or they're going to museums or they're taking vacations with their families they're learning things over the summer, um, whereas many lower income kids don't have access to those kinds of programs, um, and so they're falling behind over the summer. So, um, so it's both you know, the academic gaps, but also some of those, those opportunity gaps that we, that we take for granted. And there's also some recent studies coming out showing that teachers spend anywhere from three to four weeks each fall reteaching subject matter just to get kids to where they were at the end of the last school year. So it's really a, an inefficient use of the of you know of our system, and and again there's a, a huge research base behind it. So this isn't the summer is one of those in education there's there's lots of different ideas out there, um, but summer has an incredibly strong research be, research base behind it, um, which shows that we need to we need to address it. And then we're also seeing a lot of growth in technology, right, and using. Um, using apps and using websites and all sorts of learning opportunities for kids. Uh, so there's a, you know there's a whole host, and we're seeing more and more um, opportunities and more and more options out there for, for the summer. But really, the key is keeping kids engaged. Um, you know, it, it can be it can look and feel different for each kid, but the key is that they're um, they're reading, they're practicing their math. Um, but again, it doesn't have to be sitting in a classroom. It can be it can be done in a lot of different ways. So we're going to talk about a lot of the options that are out there and new ways to find them. So joining me is Allie DeSmet with the Clark Fox Family Foundation, and you're the project manager for, manager for Blueprint for Summer STL. So we've got the iPad here, and this is a way for us to go 
in a sense, shopping for the right program. Well, how does it work? Tell me how it works. Sure. So Blueprint for Summer is a web application. So you can just go to blueprint, the number four, summer.com, and you can easily start searching. So if I press search sessions, I go in and this is really our main page. And when you say shopping for summer programs, this is really the easiest way to do a robust search. So I can search by keyword or category or a special attribute or a time of day, a distance from a zip code or an address, so you're a not, cost. You're not, you're not suggesting what I should do with my kid, right? Right. No, we truly believe that parents know what's best for their children and are really interested in the opportunities that are, that are available. We're just trying to take some of the stress and anxiety out of planning and make it really simple. So I see at the top, you know, just from what I can see, uh, music, interest, uh, outdoors, uh, sports, soccer, science, all that kind of stuff. Right, and so you can really search from any sort of start. So if you know a category, maybe start searching there. If you know your home address and you wanna go five miles from there, start with just the address. So that you can be as limiting or as broad of a search as you want. So before we, I'm gonna ask you to search sure. for something, but free? Free to okay. use for mm -hmm. parents, for anybody to use, and it's also free for programs to list. So Doesn't necessarily mean the program that you find is free, but the service is free. Correct, so you know it's free for any organization to list their program with Blueprint for Summer, and it's free for anybody to access the information. Okay, so let's say you live in South County and you're interested in a music camp. Sure. How, how would I go about doing that? Okay, so or what I- you I'm need a zip code, because I don't- Sure. Well, how about we do a music camp okay. in 63106? So that might be a little bit closer into the city, but I can do a music camp and let's do 10 miles from 63106. And maybe that's all I know. I hit search sessions and I can easily see there's, you know, a bunch of sessions, 149 matches. You know, so I can quickly go through and maybe I want to learn about you know, passport around the world at COCA, and I want to send my ch child on a trip around the world and find out about music and art from a bunch of different countries. But I can show you a few more other searches. So maybe I want to search for robotics, you know, which is a really you know, hot topic for the summer. So maybe I want to search for robotics, and I want to search for STEM, and I, I want to search in my zip code, you know, 63108. And I want it to be less than $250 because I'm getting a little more defined. So I can hit search. I'll see that there's 12 matches that match all of that criteria. And when I find a session that's of interest to me, maybe I want to go to Advanced Robotics at Rankin, I can click on it to find more information, click to Google Maps to get directions. If I create a free account, I can save this program as a favorite. I can add it to my Blueprint calendar, which is a calendar layout that helps parents plan for summer in a really easy and visual way. So you can you know, make your search as large or as small as you want to help find the perfect best fit summer Is there program. a geographical region that this serves best right now? Sure, so it serves the city of St. Louis, the county of St. Louis, St. Charles County, and Jefferson County. We do have some programs that are, will be coming in on the Illinois side as well. So it's, it's not just like the, the best possible fanciest camps, although they're in there, right? Right. So you, if you wanted an expensive rocket camp, if that's an expensive camp, sure. but you could also find a day camp I mean, a, a playground sort of a right. program as well? So when we started uh, adding in information for Blueprint, I know that I was really surprised. We have over 1,500 sessions already on Blueprint for Summer. And like you said, it's from free all the way up to as you know a larger amount of money. But sometimes it's not only the cost, but it's really finding what truly fits your child best and what they might have an interest in. Was there a demand for this? I mean, how, how, how did this get generated? Is this something that's being done around the country? Um, clearly, 1,500 programs I would never be able to find, right? Sure. So, so there's a good service. But were people asking for this, or was were the organizations saying, we want a clearinghouse for sure. these things? Sure. So there's been a few other ways that you can find out information. So you could go to a summer camp fair. You could find maybe a listing online. But this is really unique because it's dynamic, because you can search by all of those criteria. So we did talk to families. And a lot of times when we heard, you know, why haven't you enrolled in a summer program for your child, the information simply, you know, the answer was simply, I didn't know that there was programs in my neighborhood, or I didn't know that there was a program that my child would want to go to. Yeah, if you do it by zip code, you may actually find something 
half a mile away that you didn't know existed. Exactly, and that's what we've been hearing from families. You know, that this has been a really stressful and arduous process for them, and that now it's become so simple with Blueprint for Summer, they can put in the information that's most important to them and find a program that fits for them. Is this accessible? Not everybody owns an iPad. Is this stuff that you, you think people will be able to go to the library, for example, use a computer and, and find this? That's a great question. So we, we are a web application, and what that means is you can access it on any mobile on any wireless device that has Wi-Fi. So you can use a desktop computer, you can even use your mobile phone. It's optimized to look great on any sort of mobile phone. You can use it on a tablet, so without any download necessary. And it's probably a good time to start looking at it, if not signing up already, isn't it? Definitely. So we already have, like I said, we have 1,500 camps already. Some camps are already filling up, and we know we'll have more being added soon. So check back. Great. Allie DeSmet, the name of the uh, app, Blueprint for Summer STL. Yep, so just go to www.blueprint4summer.com. Great. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Stay around. So we've got some more stuff to uh, talk about. We've got some experts who are with us in the uh, camp and summer activity field. Uh, we've got Evelyn Rice Peebles, who's the Commissioner of Recreation in the City of St. Louis. You oversee recreation centers, swimming pools, all those summer day camps, right? That's right, yes. Aaron Malone is the Director of Youth Development for Mission St. Louis, a nonprofit working in St. Louis neighborhoods, mm -hmm. running a year-round after-school program and summer youth programs as well. And our friend Maxine Clark, Clark Fox Family Foundation, education activist, founder of Build-A-Bear Workshop, and by the way, the chairman of our uh, board here at Channel 9. Thanks all for being here. Um, Evelyn, when I thought about, when we first started thinking about summer programs, I was thinking back to that progressive era 1900 folks, Dwight Davis, Charlotte Rumbold, yes. deciding that the parks were for the people. We needed to build playgrounds for children, give them somewhere to go while their moms and dads were working in the factories. Yes. This is still a real issue it is in the city, a, isn't it? It really is. And as you mentioned earlier, what is outstanding is that it is still free. And this means that families that have low income, or a number of children, perhaps not heavily resourced, can still have a good experience for their child. They are out of the house, but they're in a safe environment. They're with other children. They will go on field trips. They will do some reading. They'll have activities. This year, we're really excited. We're working with the St. Louis Science Center to have some hands-on experiential resources at our camps, and it's all completely free. Help me out, guys, because you're, you're involved in this. And I think sometimes when we're talking about this learning loss, we're saying that kids need to be drilled during the summer. They need to be in classrooms. They need to be learning things. You're talking about experiences. You're talking about exposure to things. What do kids need that is short of formalized instruction during the summer that really helps support them throughout that summer? I think, I think children need a perspective, and that's mm -hmm. what, sometimes what you don't always get in the classroom. You get book learning. When you get out into the summer and in, uh, into weekends even, uh, and you have a chance to go to the, the zoo or the parks yes. or to a camp, where they take those experiences and take what you learned in school and help it have an application to life. And in St. Louis, um, as, we, as we, you just heard, we, there's 1,500 programs already registered in Blueprint for Summer, but I just know that there's some that parents had no idea about that they just couldn't have imagined exist in our in our city, let alone three miles from their home. And I think that's the best part of it. There's ways to apply that classroom learning to a fun learning experience that's mm -hmm. casual in the summertime, maybe near a pool, maybe near a park, and learning science and math and English and writing, a myriad of activities. Erin? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we were actually talking in the back about how um, some of our students from, from a low-income families, um, their, their world is in their neighborhood. Yes. And so they could go two neighborhoods over and they're like, where are we? This is amazing. And, yes. and you're like, well, this has been here the whole time. Right. So just giving them the opportunity to get out of, of you know, the two block radius that they've been in and, and go somewhere and experience something that they maybe haven't had an opportunity to experience can be really powerful. You know, one thing that has been, it was That's a really true. big learning experience for me when we were looking at all these camps starting last summer was that some of the best camps in the country, especially day camps, exist here in St. Louis. 
and one of the best science camps um, associated with the Science Center, but is, this, is the Challenger uh, Camps. And they are in Ferguson, Missouri. And it's a cooperative program between the Ferguson Fluorescent School District, the cooperating school districts now called Ed Plus, and the Science Center, right in our backyard, right in Ferguson, Missouri. Phenomenal science, uh, space programs, robotics programs. Who knew? And a lot of families, I've, I use that one as a test. And people say, do you know where it is? I have no idea. And we tell them it's a great surprise. So it's a great way for new neighborhoods to be discovered as well, because kids can go to camp there, and it's right around the corner. I know every kid's different, and, and they have particular interests. And, and you might have a kid who really wants to go to music camp, or really wants to go to code writing mm -hmm. camp, um, or horse riding camp. But, um, some kids, and we were talking as well, that yes. you don't have to go to drama camp to get a little song and play acting mm -hmm. and artwork. You don't have to go to artwork, art camp to get artwork. Because day camp and, and, and playground camps do a lot of that stuff as part of it. I mean, that's got to be really important. It really is important. At the end of the summer, we have a big talent extravaganza. And every child has to do something. They can read a poem. They can do a little dance, and they practice, and they make costumes. They learn a lot about getting along with other cultures, mm -hmm. other neighborhoods, because they have to work together as a group. And they are so excited to perform. We invite families. We normally have our extravaganza at Keener Plaza downtown, and downtown lunchers come out and clap for the kids. And it's really a good time, and they have fun, and they experiment. And they're being creative. And again, it's at no cost. And you do some dancing, and you do some singing. And we make t-shirts, and they paint. And they learn to swim uh, to get over some of the fear of the water that a lot of people have. And it's, it, it really helps them grow. Um, I agree with what you said earlier, in a way that sometimes does not happen within the classroom. Mm -hmm. Aaron, you guys have been doing stuff at Mission St. Louis, after school programs, mm -hmm. uh, for kids not coming from necessarily the most privileged backgrounds in the exactly. summer programs. Tell me about this learning loss um, issue. I don't know if, you, if you've got the academic research on the program, but do you see the, 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 the ability to prevent these kids from sort of falling behind? Do you see that happen? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, just here recently, the Washington Post wrote an article about um, just the fact that for the first time in 50 years, um, the majority of students in the United States are coming come from low-income families. And, and even in, in St. Louis Public Schools right now, uh, almost 90% of the students are uh, qualified for free or reduced lunch. So we, we have a, a large number of our students that are, that are students that are coming from families with, that are under-resourced. Um, that they're they're coming from a single 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 parent household um, in which you know their their parents are stretched um, for time and resources and so because of that now more than ever um, our students need to, the only way to make up for that time that lost time is time so um, our students need to have these expanded learning opportunities so that they can get caught up and um, and that's exactly what we're really working for in our program. Um, we want, we want to give our students more time on task, um, do, doing, uh, like doing specific reading activities, um, working on um, the areas specifically that where they have deficits in, in math and reading. So when our students come in, we, um, we do some diagnostic testing and find out exactly where um, their areas of they, they, they need to focus and what level they're on. And then we, we have amazing volunteers um, that come in. We, we make individualized lesson plans for each one of our students and we, we, we have our volunteers come in and they work most of the time one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes two-to-one student-to-adult ratio. Um, we train them on how to read the lesson plans. We train them on kind of a basic knowledge on um, what the, the building blocks of reading are and then um, they go in and work with our students and they're committed to at least one day each week with our students for at least a semester at a time. And so that, that relationship is just, is, is helping our students grow Let tremendously. Let me ask you, uh, quickly, worst case scenario, Maxine, for kids who don't have access to some kind of a program, uh, for any of you, what are they doing or what are they not doing? Are they stuck at home? Are they 
you know, uh, taking care of their brothers and sisters? Mm -hmm. What are they doing? All of the above can happen. And they may live in a neighborhood where there is a community center, there is a pool, there are activities, and they may be under, you know, not as supervised as they maybe should be. But one of the things that I think is so exciting about Evelyn's programs and other parks and recreation departments throughout the county, uh, all of the counties of St. Louis, St. Charles, and Jefferson, there are tremendous programs available that are right around the corner, and all parents really need to know is find out about them. Um, yes. Because they're there, and I think the biggest problem that under-resourced families have is they haven't had the knowledge uh, and easy access to the programs. And now we're bringing that through Blueprint for Summer, particularly, but because the schools now know about it and the, right. the community centers and the churches, there's going to be re much easier access. Uh, any library, you can turn on the computer and find an activity. And because there's so many of them in the city of St. Louis in particular, uh, but even in North County that are so affordable, then children that where the concert, where po poverty is concentrated will have so many more opportunities. Mm -hmm. They have been there, by the way. Parents just didn't know about them. Right. Mm -hmm. Very briefly, Evelyn, should people be signing up? Can they be signing up for summer programs yet? Yes. And how, how, how long is too long to wait? I would say past the very beginning of April is too long to wait. We are accepting signups right now, and we will continue accepting them until we're finished with all enrollment, and then we start waiting lists. And it's, it's very sad when parents say, I wish I had known about this earlier. Right. Well, that's what so we're trying to get the word out. This is a big service. Right. Thank you. We want to hear from you as well. Join the conversation on Twitter, our hashtag stay tuned STL and hashtag AMGRAD STL. Stick with us. We're going to keep talking about this. Maxine Clark still with us, joined now by Mike Ballone, Executive Director of South City Prep Charter School, running from 5th through ninth grade starting this year as well. Interesting thing about this school, longer school day and no traditional summer vacation. Exactly. What's the thinking on that? Right. So um, we're actually a year-round school, and the thinking is exactly what we're here to talk about tonight, which is the prevalence of the summer learning loss for our kids. Ninety percent of our kids qualify for free and reduced lunch. 90% of our kids are minority. And so we've designed a school that its intention is to help eliminate the summer learning loss. And so we start school in mid-August and we go all the way to mid-July with our students. And uh, we divide the school year into eight-week cycles. We have five eight-week cycles. Um, and then we take two-week breaks. So we have our spring break coming up here in about a week and a half. Our kids get two weeks off um, during that time. And our hope is that we, um, and this is our fourth year of operation, um, we see that um, over the course of our summer session that we're still able to offer a rigorous academic content, we're still able to offer a traditional school year, and we're still able to engage our students throughout the summer. So when they come back and join us in August, we don't, have, we don't spend as long uh, having that makeup time. We mentioned three or four weeks of teachers having to make that makeup time, and we are, we're able to eliminate that. Yeah, this is something that comes up periodically. Francis Howell did it for a long exactly. time. Um, I stopped it for not net educational reasons, I think for budgetary reasons. Right. Um, but this debate about year-round school, should we change this traditional idea that is often said to be based on an agricultural economy? Uh, Maxine, you're, you're, you're big into charter schools mm -hmm. and educational ideas. Is this idea of shifting away from that long summer vacation, is that something that's that's being talked about, tried here and there? Is, where, where are we with no, that? I think what do you hear? I think it certainly should be an option for children and for parents to decide uh, because it's, it, it, it can help some children. Other children may not need all of that uh, formal classroom education, but many, many kids do. And I think the opportunities in a classroom environment, in a school environment, you can take, it doesn't have to mean that you're always just doing reading, writing, and arithmetic. You're doing coding, you're doing arts, you're doing dance, you're doing music in, a, in an environment that connects the dots for you. It gives it a perspective. And I think that's really what we do need. But it, it, it should be a parent's choice. 
uh, to decide what they think their children need at the suggestion of its, the teachers and the counselors at the school. And not every school is for everybody. I'm for good schools, great schools, and there are many of them in the St. Louis City and the county and, and our charter schools that offer those kinds of options. Uh, school sometimes doesn't, um, is, is required to be about 175 or 180 days, mm -hmm. and charter schools have more days, but they also have longer days, and sometimes Saturdays as well. So it gives parents, actually, a lot of parents like it because they're working and they know that their children are safe and they're in an environment where they're getting more education as well. And Mike, again, when we talk year-round school, it's not really year-round. You're talking about, about the same number of days that you would have in a traditional school, maybe a few more, right? Right, yeah, so we have 183 school days and we just, we're allocating them in different places, right? So instead of a three-month summer break, our students get about five weeks. Um, and we're taking that summer break and, and allocating it throughout the year. And so it also, is, it's helpful for our students, we know, um, to, uh, to help them stay focused for that the entire year. And like taking breaks a little bit more periodically allows them to recharge their batteries and be ready for school. And so we're seeing a higher focus there, which is also a, another benefit of that. Does research back that up? I and mean, as you guys are looking, I'm not sure if you've offered this because it's a great alternative that certain people want, or is it something you're sold on based on what the research is telling you? I mean, we're, we're sold on it because of the research around the summer learning loss. And, uh, and the research that we have both internally is that we know that when we assess our students at the end of the school year in July and assess them again when they come back in August and September, there's a very minimal loss, if any. And so our students are retaining that information in our shorter summer, which, which we're very encouraged about. Where our kids make about a year and a half to two years worth of growth every year, which is, which is outstanding for, for the population we're working with, for sure. Yeah, and I think one of our experts uh, earlier on had said that, in fact, math, as, as I experienced, is actually an easier um, subject to lose ground in than literacy. If you're in an environment where you're being read to or you're reading or you're surrounded by books. So the, the, the reading improvement might be a bigger issue uh, or an easier issue to solve than, than math um, loss. And I don't know mm -hmm. if that's, that's true or not, how, how we approach reading and, and math in different ways. Right. So. Um, we, we obviously, um, we see growth throughout the entire year and, 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 a, and a, hardly any, if any loss um, over the summer and all those subject areas, including science as well. So. Do you see these ideas going mainstream? Again, we talk about Francis Howell um, as being an example of a year-round school system. Some people liked it, some people didn't like it. Mm -hmm. um, but again, do we see this, do you think, uh, Maxine, going mainstream or these ideas maybe being tested in charter schools and then applied on a larger, larger scale? I think they are being applied, and that was the intention of charter schools, to become innovation spots, places where we could see if it would work, and then we would apply it to the mainstream school districts. But in Jennings, for instance, uh, I know that in their middle school, I visited their middle school not too long ago, and they are on a similar uh, program uh, that they decided as a school district they wanted to do, and they are doing employing a lot of techniques that are known to be used in charter schools, but why can't they be applied to regular schools? The, the um, schools in the magnet school system in St. Louis are also similar schools. They have a lot of experiential learning uh, that allows the children and the students, middle schools and high schools, uh, to have different kind of um, project-based learning so that they're doing and learning at the same time. I visited Grand Center Arts Academy a, a week or so ago, and the kids are really engaged in the work through, through arts. Uh, they're in a, a makerspace class where they're designing products uh, entrepreneurs, if you will, uh, and I think those things are also expanding to many other schools in the in the city and county. And even if you've got a five-week break, you still have an opportunity to go to rocket camp or something oh, yeah. if you want, right? Oh, exactly. Where I, well, yeah, we've we've already engaged. I don't know why I'm always bringing up rocket camp. Yeah, it's probably something. That. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we've already engaged with with um, Blueprint for Summer and and already talked with them because yeah, our our families still do need access. Um, and still seek access to, to, for those summer opportunities even during our five-week break. Yeah. Most of the camps in St. Louis that we've, we have registered are a week long. You can go for two weeks or three weeks or four mm -hmm. weeks, but you can fit in a week between exactly. sessions and have a really incredible learning experience. And we hope that the schools and the teachers that teach art and teach music and teach science will look at this and refer their students to some of the programs that are listed from the science camps at the Science Center, the Challenger Camp, to the COCA, to the music camp. There's also programs of literacy at the libraries all around St. Louis. And of course, the parks and recreation camps are phenomenal. I must, I, I'm thinking that when parents first get their kids into um, this year-round schedule or the lack of traditional summer break schedule, right. it's a bit of an adjustment, especially maybe if you've got kids in 
in, in a traditional school versus, but um, I, I would imagine they adjust. There are probably some things they, they're not crazy about, but other things that they find some advantage to. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And we have to do a lot of education with our families um, uh, to, to make sure that they're ready for, for a different schedule. Um, they, they really love, I, in speaking with most of our families, they really love the summer because it is, we are in session and there's a place where their kid is and they know what their education they're getting, they know the support they're getting, they know it's a safe place. And so they, they really like that. But there is definitely an education there and it's, it can be hard for some families, especially for some of our seventh and eighth graders who, who in some cases might be taking care of their younger siblings who might not attend South City Prep, they might be going to a traditional calendar. And so that can be hard and so we, we, we work as hard as we can to educate our families and to, to make sure that we're connecting them so that their, their kid can help be, stay at South City Prep during the summer and be successful. Right, Mike Malone from South City Prep. Maxine Clark, stick around with us. We're gonna continue the conversation. Also wanna hear from you uh, on Twitter. Our hashtags are stay tuned STL and amgrad STL. We'll be right back. summers when I was a kid and you know you learn a lot there but really the biggest thing is the friends I made I, I still hang out with a lot of the same people that I went to those summer camps with so for me it was really about making lifelong friends this needed my children have an opportunity now Ferguson Florissant School Districts do provide that opportunity and the only challenges would be that having that transportation summer camp is a place like no other it allows for people like me, kids like me, to explore, be creative, and challenge ourselves. It's a passion of mine, and I love it. So some kids absolutely love camp, some kids hate camp, and they never want to go back. But that's part of growing up, is figuring out what you like and what you don't like. Joining us again, Evelyn Rice Peebles. Commissioner of Recreation for the City of St. Louis. This is Jenny Wolkowitz. She's a St. Louis advisor at Tips on Trips and Camps, and you're gonna explain that in just a moment. And Aaron Malone from Mission St. Louis. Tell me again, just uh, you, whether your own personal experiences or things you've heard, how cool is camp for kids? And again, I will say this, I, I had two, two daughters, they both absolutely loved Girl Scout camp. They had friends who would never go back. They hated <laughs> tents, they hated outhouses, other kids, will go back every year. So tell me about your own experiences about summers. What sticks with you that was good or maybe something that, that was bad? I loved summer camp. My children loved summer camp. And I did my first slow dance at summer camp. <laughs> and I learned how to tie dye a t-shirt in summer <laughs> camp and I will never forget it. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's, that's, that's the thing about this. I mean kids, you must get this, um, Aaron, from kids who who've done an after-school program and come back and say, oh, this is what I remember. What do you, what do you hear? Um, well, our kids, they, first of all, we take them to places like Six Flags. Last year we had a jug band, which is, um, which is pretty, <laughs> is a pretty cool thing. So then just getting experiences with like music and um, we had a music and art fusion class and um, our students did woodworking with, beyond, with uh, building futures. Um, earn a bike so just they just really love the opportunity to get a lot of different experiences um, that they that they had never been able to experience before so Jenny Wilkowitz you are uh, with tips on trips and camps and I'm gonna yes. say that you're sort of the travel agent for, uh, for, for for camps and summer programs does that sound right that is a good way to explain it it's a free service matching. free is good right. free is good yeah uh, we match families kids with summer overnight camps and so in the summers I visit camps and I see them for myself so that I can better represent them to the families and um, parents know their kids I know the camps and together we can find the right match and this is like all over the country if yes I just want to send my kids to I don't mean send my kids sure but 
let them experience the mountains far away? Absolutely. There are a, about 11,000 camps, overnight camps, in the United States alone. Um, if you want the mountains, you go to Colorado or the Carolinas. If you want lakes, you go to Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, there's all sorts of other questions we ask families to try and find the right match. What about family camps? Is that a separate separate area? We, we do represent some family camps um, and that is I think it's a great way for families to investigate camps. Um, I often talk about a blueprint for finding the right camp for your family and that can be dating back a whole year ahead of the summer that you intend to send the child so you can go visit a camp as a family learn the routines of the dining hall, mm -hmm. see the camp itself so that when the kid comes on their own, they have a much more familiar feeling about the place. Is it pretty much a traditional thing? Is this, are camps today kind of the way we might imagine camps from even the 1920s or 30s or 50s sure. or 60s, or are they all, you know, or are we all over the map on this? Uh, we are definitely all over the map. There are still very traditional back to basics camps where kids can live in a platform tent or even a yurt or a cabin um, to the very um, non-traditional type camps on a college campus. Um, there are enrichment programs for kids. You know, we talked about the summer slide. And so do you want to send them away and let them have that overnight experience, but also experience some academic enrichment over the summer? There's that too. Again, part of this, and I want to keep going back to this idea that we talk about the, 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 the learning loss. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be teaching kids formally, that the experiences that they're getting yes. can be just as important as the classroom lessons. Absolutely. Uh, one of the most exciting, I think, and important aspects is young people have to learn to get along with one another. Mm -hmm. They have to accept responsibility for their actions. They have to be able to accept supervision, follow directions, get in water, go in other neighborhoods and be at peace and sleep, feel safe. Sleep through a thunderstorm maybe? Right. Sleep, yes. If it's bad, everyone has to get together and look out for their buddy. Yeah. At one of our camps, and again, we're free, they elect a citizen each week, that's the citizen of the week, and then they elect a mayor and they vote. And so it's some basics in mm -hmm. politics and government that we're putting in. And I think people don't understand that to have an enriching experience, you do not have to spend a lot of money. If you choose to, that's fine. But for example, we were excited when the Science Center said they wanted to partner with us so that right in our own neighborhoods, young people could learn and grow things and find out things that were new to them in the comfort of their peer group, but outside the classroom. Mm -hmm. So Jenny, if, if we, we can send a, uh, our kids to a traditional, uh, you know, a screened you know, cabin and, sure. and all of that, what are the trends? What are the hot new trends in, in summer programs, summer camps? Sure, well. Let's say we've got some money, you know, if, that's, sir, if that's a factor. Sure. Specialty camps have become um, highly popular. Um, and that is for the parent who is really looking to develop a passion or, or their child already has a passion and they want to further develop it. So there can be specialty camps in sports or in drama or in art and, or in acting. Um, community service is definitely a big thing. Um, there are trips for even middle school age kids to high school age kids. STEM programming, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, hugely popular. Um, I think as a result of many um, television shows, uh, you've got something like entrepreneurial camps where kids work in project groups and you know learn to launch a business. Um, so there is everything under the map. So I, I would imagine though, Aaron, and a lot of the things that are being talked about as maybe a high-priced camp are maybe some of the things that are also being introduced in in, in maybe more subtle or, or everyday ways in an after school or, or program that you could go to in, in the city in your neighborhood. Yeah, exactly. We give, we give the students probably a, a variety of opportunities and then, um, I mean, it would be great to, to send them along your guys' way to have some more specialty opportunities after that, so, you know, for them to kind of get their feet wet and, and, some, and some different things and then move to something where they can maybe delve a little bit deeper into 
into those opportunities. And yeah. what's important yes. to know is there, there are camps of every different um, economic level. So as you mentioned, the Girl Scout and Boy Scout camps are definitely more affordable. And then there's everything up to the very high end. And if you start your research early enough, there are scholarships out there. Um, I know of um, Camp for All Kids is an organization that sends kids to camp. Um, once they're uh, accepted, they send them to camp for life. So they can go from third grade to ninth grade, you know. And, and social service, Kev, you, you mentioned that. And I yeah. wanted to say, is that like going into, you know, uh, building, you know, building houses or, or cleaning up neighborhoods or yeah. whatever? Yeah, so there are community service programs, mainly for teens, so, yeah. you know, 12, 13, on, on the way, all the way up to high school. Um, and it can be anything from building and construction to working with children to um, animal rehabilitation, um, ecology, cleaning trails, so all sorts of different types of work. Great. Well, guys, stick around. We've been hearing from folks on, on Twitter, hashtag stay tuned STL and hashtag amgrad STL. We'll take a look at that and we'll bring everybody back in, talk about how important some of this stuff is. Stay with us. Okay, we're back with everybody. Fill me in. Uh, first of all, I want to I, I want to go back to this idea that it's the uh, the end of February, but probably not too early for parents to at least be exploring what they're going to be doing. And I don't necessarily mean sending their kids off to to Colorado, but also sending their kids to the local park in the city. Right? That's correct. Local parks and recreation, where we offer programming. We offer a free breakfast and lunch. And we offer a safe yet stimulating environment that's often very, very close to home. So even if they don't have transportation, they can walk. Yeah. And more, uh, uh, more demand than space every year, probably. Every year we have young people that are on waiting lists that may not make it into camp because we do fill up, because we are competitive and yet we're free. And we're fun. And the word spreads in the neighborhood you want to go to Wold Camp, or you want to go to Cherokee, or you want to go to Tandy, don't miss it. And, uh, and we really are very patient and gentle with children who do not know how to swim. We make sure everyone swims. Yeah. Tell me more about your guys' experiences. Anybody personal experiences, again, that, that comes back from a, from a summer activity, a summer camp? I went to a day camp in, in our junior high school. And they had, I, I didn't know what I was missing. I had friends that went away to sleepaway camp. I had a great time. And my favorite was art. And when I was old enough to be a junior counselor, which I think is another important aspect of a lot of the camp programs is a job for a teenager, um, I w became an art counselor at a camp. And I absolutely loved it. And it really taught me uh, a lot about uh, perspective and creativity and curiosity uh, and fun. I would agree with Maxine. I've been a camper and a counselor, and being a counselor is almost as much fun as being a camper. It's hard work, um, and you don't get the pay that you would at a normal job, but you get the um, psychic income, I would say, um, from a job well done. Choosing the right people for any kind of a program is, is important um, in terms of the kinds of young people, I'm guessing it's mostly young people, who are are teaching or, or, or being camp counselors or day camp people? Do, 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 you, do you find you get a lot of people coming up through the program who end up yes. helping out? Yes, mm -hmm. as, as particularly if they have high, 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 high energy. You have got to have high energy to work with groups of young people. And once they're hooked, they come back year after year 
we have a lot of volunteers, and you mentioned community programs and community service. Mm -hmm. We also can give community service hours if young people who are older than 16 want to come and volunteer. They are welcome to get in touch with us, and we will grant community service hours. And, and they have fun, too. They make friends. And Ellie, it's again, I think the, the thing here is that there's more out there than people imagine, and maybe it's more accessible than people imagine. Is that what the service is going to help show people? Right. So that was the goal with Blueprint for Summer STL. So we wanted to make it as easy to use and as accessible as possible, so you can use it on any device. There's already over 1,500 sessions, and it's, it's time to start planning. So there's almost 400 out of those 1,500 that have scholarships available. So even if there's a cost, there's a lot of opportunity to find the right program and find the right price for you. So let's go back to this issue again. This, the camp is great, should be fun, should be, you should learn something, you should have some great memories. But this idea of keeping the mind active, right? Um, I won't say continuing to learn and to teach, but keeping the mind active. Is that what this is about? Yeah, I mean, it's extremely important, and we feel like we feel like a great school can all doesn't doesn't have to be a place where um, where learning is boring or learning is is just real stagnant. We believe a great school can be a place where that is can be just as fun as as any other camp or any other activity. And we 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 believe our school can be like that for our kids, right? So this is a, it's a place where we're stimulating the mind and and we're creating opportunity in a place where um, with kids are learning throughout the year, not just in nine months. You know, one of the things that I think is really interesting about the, the proverbial classroom is that many of these camps offer programs in other people's classroom. Like there will be a COCA camp right here at the Nine Network, mm -hmm. teaching kids how to produce a news story, how to produce a television show. Mm -hmm. There's cooking camps that are in actual restaurants and in uh, Sweetology where they're gonna teach kids how to decorate uh, cakes at third degree glass works. They're going to be teaching children how to blow glass and create artwork in those buildings, not at, at COCA or not in a park necessarily, but in another classroom. Yeah. And I think making a building like this turn into a classroom, I think that's the greatest opportunity for all of our children in the community is for them to see how life really unfolds, what, they, what, what a job really takes in a fun environment. And maybe they'll be, you know, Jim Kircher someday. Maybe they'll be an artist. Maybe they'll be uh, a coder. Um, but they would not have discovered that had they not had an exposure to the a camp opportunity uh, that's available here in St. Louis. It's amazing what's available. Aaron, what, 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 do, what do parents need to realize? I, I, I hate to preach to parents because parents are, are, are busy people and they care about their kids and they know their kids. So I don't want to say what should we be telling parents, but that's what I'm going to say. What, what should parents understand about the value of, of summer um, or, or different programs, but also not the, the need, now it's me saying it, not the need to overdo it. Yeah, I, I think balance is good for our students and giving them, giving them a variety of options so that they can, they can really um, kind of decide you know, what, what kind of works for them, which is why it's really great that there's so many opportunities out there that they can really um, kind of pick and choose what, what might work for them. Yeah. I would like to piggyback on that because I think where school um, speaks to the intelligence quotient of a child, summertime can really speak to the emotional quotient of a child. Um, and yeah. what they're learning at a summer camp, whether it's the most back to basics or the, you know, a sports oriented camp, um, they're really learning to unlock different portions of their brain. They're learning to navigate choices and choosing activities. Um, they're taking part in the responsibility chart of the cabin. Um, there's just so much more to summer camp than people realize. And I think if you speak to any director of an overnight camp, he will be so passionate, he or she will be so passionate about what they're teaching their kids and their philosophy of their camp. It's not just some place to send your camp, send your kids, um, much more than that. What are, what are the trends for you guys? I mean, what, what are, kids, are kids coming in now and saying, Okay, we, we, we want to play soccer and we want to, you know, we'll, we'll call her, but are they also demanding, you know, things, saying, can we do this, we want to do that? Every year we are asked if we can extend camps, can we start earlier and go longer? By the kids or by the parents? Both. Okay, I get the, the parents' part, yeah. The kids, <laughs> and the last day of camp, the kids don't want to leave. Uh, they've made friends, 
they hug their counselors, uh, some of them cry, um, they exchange numbers, they sign t-shirts, they sign shoes, they sign everything. But we've been asked the most, can we extend the camps? And we simply aren't able to. Uh, I really have a lot of respect for city government that we continue to do this at no charge. Mm -hmm. yes. But that's, that's what we get the most of. Could you go through July? And no, we can't at this time. I used to get questions all the time. OK, my, the day camp ends, and now I need one week to fill between day camp and the start of school. And you know, so they'd ask me for August 8th through 14th. That's a little bit more minutia than I know. And I'm so thrilled with Blueprint for St. Louis that this is now an available resource for families because they can search literally by the week um, with yes. two working parents. It's, I mean, it's not necessarily a luxury anymore for summer camp. Mm -hmm. It's a necessity. Mm -hmm. And so they have to fill the Correct. whole summer. Yeah. And, and I would imagine at some camps, um, there's computers being used. Uh, is there still an idea that put your cell phones away and let's have camp? Yes. 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 My daughter goes yes. to a camp where there's no screens allowed. Is that right? She can't even have an iPod if it has a screen. Um, so they are completely uh, no technology whatsoever. And she actually loves it. She says she doesn't miss it at all. Yeah. And but, that's, that's true with us yeah. as well. But there's also some great camps in St. Louis at the Science Center, at the Challenger uh, Space Camps, and uh, different places, COCA too, where they're teaching kids to in, use a computer um, as a possible uh, job, you know, a career, how to program, how to code, how to do robotics. And those are things that are fun too. They're not always bad, especially when they're being applied to learning. And some kids may not have that access to those, that kind of equipment and those tools in the schools that they go to. OK, stick around. We're going to continue the conversation online. But I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. And it's not too early to be thinking about what your kid's going to be doing this summer. Thanks for joining us. So the, the I mean, I'm wondering the, the 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 asking the kids to put their screens away, put their iPads down, turn off their cell phones. How long does that adjustment take? I mean, that's a hard habit to get out of. I don't know what you guys do for after-school programs or summer programs, if because they may still need to be in touch with their with their parents and stuff like that. Well, we use iPads in our program for re during reading time. So we do a lot of like ebooks, um, and and even for our students, where when their um, their readability and then um, their interests, there's kind of a dis there's a, a big gap between the right. two. Um, there's a lot of research out there that shows that if students are um, older students are following along with the with the ebook while they're listening to it that there's still some word recognition skills that are being um, that are that they're using and and so um, it's still a really great way for for them to um, build their reading skills yeah it's a good application of mm -hmm. something so okay. yeah that does that sounds really but, innovative yeah but for for the the uh, the city uh, day camps no phones no put phones. them away okay oh, they, they sneak them though you know they don't <laughs> and and what happens they're moving around so much yeah. that you can really either break it or lose it. And then we eliminate the competition of who's got the newest of the new that mm -hmm. just came out. So we tell parents, no electronic devices. And if a camper brings one, we just have them call and let someone know that you need to come and get this phone. And then we have a staff person hold the phone until that evening when the parent comes. And then we ask them, not to send it back. But with going swimming and getting up and going and eating and going to the playgrounds, going on field trips, it's a lot to keep up with. Yeah. My yeah. youngest daughter goes to camp for four weeks. And like I said, it's a no screen camp. And she finds that it's, it's a real breather from the, the year of the social pressures of keeping up with yeah. Facebook and Instagram and every other yeah, social media. I think there's a period, but once you, once you get through that, uh, you're, you're happy to you can yeah. break that it's, habit. Yeah, it's really something we have to do for our kids to give them the balance because they're unbalanced in that direction. They're constantly connected, and they need to. I think it's a good experience. And while there's camps that that do teach kids how to use computers productively uh, and creatively, I still think there's times when they just have to be kids, mm -hmm. and they really have to get outside and uh, enjoy what's around them and not worry about being connected. 
I, I think you bring up a, a lot of things, and whether it's in schools or after school programs, it's being thrown in with, with a different bunch of kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, that's um, a big, yeah, And that's... yeah, I mean, why is that important? I mean, are kids isolated within their own areas so that they don't, aren't exposed, to, I mean, I guess you're not exposed to a lot of things, including other types of people, right? No, I think it's a big opportunity to make new friends. As Evelyn said, they make friends, they don't want to leave their friends. But if they get a chance to go away for, to camp, I remember my friends, uh, that came, went away to, to camp for a sleepaway camp, they came home and they had friends that I didn't even know. Right. And I remember how that felt, not always so great. But they made new friends. And when they went away to college, they reconnected even with some of their, their friends that they made at camp. And I think that's a great advantage. But I think in the camps that exist here in St. Louis, they draw from such a broad range of, yes. of demographics that kids have a chance to really become friends with kids that live across town. They don't know that. They don't know where they live. They don't really care. But at the, at the science camp or at the art camp or the music camp, they're all one and they're a team and they're playing together and they're performing together mm -hmm. and they're yes. having fun. And that's what we really need in St. Louis. We need those handshakes across the community. And children are a great way to have them um, because they really have no inhibitions and they'll have a lot of fun making new friends yeah. and having new experiences Yeah, together. my kids have done that where they, they, they meet somebody and think, oh, I think I went to such and such camp with that. With that, with that person, so they do yeah. make those those connections. Get them off the high schools and into what camp they went to. That might right. be more, right. more, and, more and productive. And they can forge a new identity. <laughs> because right. you may be shy or have a certain group that you are around at your school, but at camp, you're a whole new person. No one has to know that you weren't the most popular or that you don't read as well as you'd like to or whatever it may be. You, you're fresh, it's a new beginning, there are no labels, there's right. no baggage. You get to be all new, or and you're not the best athlete at school and yes. at camp. You you can you run from here to yeah, the end, and, and you win a blue ribbon because sure. everybody but, gets a. But ribbon. because you have you've got all these different kinds of programs, it used to be that if you were the only math geek in camp, you might be the only math geek mm -hmm. in camp. Now you can go to math geek camp. Yes, yes. if right. that's what you want. <laughs> that's true. If, if if that's where you're you're most comfortable. I, I think, just oh sorry. Go ahead. I think one of the things that's really unique in St. Louis, for example, is the Gifted Resource Center. Um, they have summer academies that are for students that are gifted, and it's you know any sort of summer opportunity that collects students around a common interest mm -hmm. really gives them an opportunity to engage with each other around that interest. So you know we might all have an interest in studying about cooking, or we might all have an interest in studying about robotics, but that connects us you know outside of where we live or what zip code we reside in or even what we look like. But really, it's just about you know what we're doing in camp together and what we share as a common yeah, interest. Ch child, the way children play and they pretend and they dress up. Well, there's a camp called the Mini, the Little Medical School, which is a really amazing for young children to teach them about, not only about maybe possibly what do doctors and nurses and dentists and yeah. health professionals do, but what, what is health? And how do I advocate for my own health? It is an amazing experience for children, and it's all they have them all over St. Louis, and I think it's one of those things that I said, who would have known? Maybe I would have been a doctor had I been able to go to a camp like that. Yeah. And that's not their full intent, but maybe they will be inspiring young doctors, but they will definitely be inspiring young, young healthy children uh, because they'll know a lot more about their health than they would have known otherwise. Yeah. Well, thanks for all the work you guys are doing and bringing all these things to kids. And uh, um, I hope they come up and have some great experiences through all of this Thank stuff. You. So again, thank, thank you, you John.